so I've been working mainly on influenza, but a whole variety of different areas within influenza. So we've been looking, well, my PhD was looking at the strain models. How do you model there being multiple strains interacting? And starting from a very theoretical end, trying to get the mathematics of that right and work out to make a tractable model to work with. Uh, then we've thought about influenza within host dynamics. We thought about influenza uh, spatial dynamics, particularly looking at a large data set from 2009 uh, of the pandemic US then. 2017, 2018, uh, we were approached by uh, BBC, a, a company making documentaries for BBC, and we made a, a programme called Contagion, the BBC Pandemic. And this was about communicating what the mathematics and the science is um, behind understanding pandemics and, and what will be done to understand pandemics in future. But as part of that, we had this big citizen science experiment where we had an app collecting data and UK users could volunteer to do this and track how they moved over the course of a day and who they had contact with. Uh, that data collection was complete last year and now we've got a huge data set on how people move and interact in the UK. And we've got lots of work now to pull that into pandemic models to try and better inform um, how diseases spread in, in the UK and hopefully it'll be useful for other countries to, to draw upon what we learn from that. that. That's an interesting question because there's a lot of work in the community of course to think about influenza. In fact there's a lot of us who've been working on influenza and our picture of a, a modern pandemic is very much that of influenza. So we think about the 2009 historical um, pandemics, we don't think so much of SARS because it was quite different and what's happening now is, is, is really quite different. We've got to be really careful that our modelling thinking is not too much shaped by it's just a special version of influenza. Um, maybe it's similar in some ways, but we should be very much aware of how it's different as well. Traditionally, if you think about how disease modelling uh, in its largest sense, because the community we've got here at this meeting is very broad, from very theoretical to super data driven and very everything in between, and the theory of the, of the model building and development through the statistical and inference size and the data side. We've got everything here. And where we fit in, as well as just being curious about the science, um, people think of us first in terms of prediction as the obvious application. But actually, traditionally, more we spend our time trying to understand what's happened in the past and learn from that to help prevent things in the future and draw out general lessons. Um, but we're in a really different time now. This is this mid-February 2020. And it's not at all clear what's going to happen next uh, with COVID-19 coronavirus. Um, and it's a difficult question for us as where we fit right from the theoretical end to the data driven end. Um, it's very tempting for us to say we don't have enough data because we don't. There isn't much data out there. We don't know this. We don't know that. So we can't say this for sure. Um, but do you know what? If, if we want to know what happens uh, in the next six months, we wait six months, but that's no practical use at all. Uh, instead, I think we've got responsibility to help as much as we can, not just answer our curiosity about the epidemics, but to answer specific questions about control measures. Say, would it help if we do this or that? Would it help if we close schools or not? Uh, should countries be bracing for a large epidemic? But what is it we can do about this? Is it right to have travel restrictions in place? So. It might be more comfortable for us to say we don't have enough data, we can't do this, but we should try and do what we can. Um, that doesn't mean every single one of us should drop whatever we're doing and switch to working on coronavirus. That would not be healthy or good at all. Um, but I hope a lot of uh, disease modelers will get involved. And there are lots of ways we can do this. I mean, part is to help. I mean, the good th one of the things we're good at as models, I should, I should breathe, shouldn't I? <laughs> So one of the things that we can do as modelers quite early on is just to identify which of the many unknowns are important. So we might say we don't know what R0 is, we don't know what the serial interval is, we don't know what the latent period is, how long before you become infectious, how long before you have symptoms. There's a lot of unknowns. One of the things we can do as modelers is identify which of those unknowns actually matter. And by matter, I mean as in matter to decisions about control measures. So if we know this, we could better answer this question, is travel restrictions you know, important or, or whatever. So job number one for us is identify which of the unknowns matter, rather than saying we don't know. The second thing is, this is a different pandemic, but there's lots of commonalities with past, past pandemics and past events. Um, so if we're hypothetically thinking about closing schools in some area if there's a small outbreak. Do we know what the effect of that is? Well, we've never had this exact virus before, 
but there's been other things where schools have been closed or, uh, for example, teacher strikes or because of other things that schools have been closed. So we can start to look at those effects. So where we're good with the statistics and models is to try and connect in past data and say how it would apply to this situation. So to try and extrapolate from really different scenarios to speak to this problem is something this community could help with. The third area we could be useful in, we're in a really different time in terms of how the science is communicated at the moment. Um, if you think about it, even the, the SARS, which I don't think it was that long ago, 17 years, I suppose, Twitter didn't exist then. Um, the way we're communicating now, Twitter's part of it, the way scientists are communicating very quickly with online things, um, that's good. But we've also got a lot of noise to the signal. There's a lot coming out very quickly from a lot of groups. And actually, it's very difficult. You can't read all the papers that come out in the day. You, you physically cannot if you sit there and read all day. Um, even the community who aren't involved directly with modelling coronavirus could help by looking at this, commenting on uh, these things, and if they see papers that are particularly good or useful, to help that signal-to-noise ratio by to promote these to colleagues and say, look, this is a really interesting approach, have a look at this. Or when you've got things that differ, um, maybe as modelers, we have some understanding of why, because they've taken this subtly different hidden assumption, of course this one's going to overestimate in that way. And that's a way the wider modelling community could get involved so this meeting is wonderfully uh, timely, but it's brought together mathematicians and modellers and statisticians from a, a variety of areas. Uh, and this is a wonderful place. It just leads to lots of discussions happening, you know, around everything at lunch, in the breaks, people will be going for walks and talking. Um, there's an extra buzz and extra pressure because of coronavirus. And there seems to be more discussions happening across the different groups. So rather than this group is interested in this set of problems, this group... Actually, it's making us maybe connect up more in different ways. So this might be the start of lots of interesting threads which will persist beyond the current threat and hopefully uh, to help tackle further problems in the future.